so far I have discussed about infrared spectroscopy as a part of the different techniques for the advanced spectroscopic analysis. So now I am going to move on to the Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy. Well, Fourier transformation is a very uh, generic term. Normally, it is used in different diffraction technique like X-ray diffraction or electron diffraction, where the information in the real space, that is X, Y, Z space, is converted into the Fourier space or the inverse of real space. So, to give you a better idea, in a spectroscopic technique, we normally measure certain signal. Suppose this is signal strength in the y axis, is plotted as a function of optical path difference that is in distance or in x, and we have a signal given in the blue color plot. So, if you want to Fourier transform this, what you get is obviously x axis as inverse of distance that is centimeter inverse and we can always denote these parameters 1 by 2 pi by lambda that is or 1 by 2 pi by lambda or 1 by lambda which way you can define it will come back to wave number. It can be plotted as a again single strength or signal strength. So, there you can get different peaks 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 many peaks are present here. So, that is what is called Fourier transformation of the spectroscopic data. So, that means time axis is changed by f of t and we get into wave numbers. Okay. So, this path difference can be uh, plotted a uh, change to wave number. Now, there are many other things which we need to define before we actually go into the FTR results and FTR experiments. So, the first one is the resolution. You know, separate resolution means the ability to resolve two distinct points in the, in the space. So, that means separation of the various spectral wavelengths here, usually defined wave numbers, is what is known as resolution. So, resolution means this different spectral whatever coming spectral aspect that is the peaks coming, they are coming at different wave numbers, whether can you see them separately or not. It can be set up uh, in a FTR machine. So, a setting of 4 to 8 centimeter inverse is basically sufficient for most of the solids and the liquid, but gases requires higher resolutions. So, they needs resolution of 2 centimeter inverse or better and this is well known that high resolution experiments will always have lower signal to noise ratio. That means, if you want to have higher signal to noise ratio, you better do the experiments at lower resolutions and signal will be better then. There are other things which you also need to know is the you know a spectrum is what is collected in a uh, FTR. A spectrum is collected resolution of 1 centimeter inverse if 4 data points are collected within each spectral interval of 1 centimeter inverse. This is how this resolution is set in a machine. So, in order to acquire basically spectrum at a very high resolution and increased number of data points are required. That means, longer state of the moving mirror, mirror which we will show you when I discuss how the FTR required. High resolution instruments also requires aperture because it you need to improve the parallelism of the interferometer which is used in the FTR. Now, FTR we always receive signals or other uh, different kinds of signals where there will be noises and we need to reduce, reduce this unwanted noises or oscillations and so that the signal contribution can be increased or appropriately seen. And there we need to use certain kind of mathematical operations after we receive the data from the machine and this mathematical operations are required to basically reduce oscillations or the maybe the noise contribution. So, one such technique or uh, this such technique is called known as apodization and uh, this is shown here. Suppose, this is the interferogram or the FTR signal versus data points. You see as you go on the higher values of data points, the number of uh, noise is basically increasing. So, we take a window and define apodization function and then reduce this noise. So, there are many functions uh, used in the literature 
they can be Bia Norton or cosine or half cancel. So, these are not part of this code. So, I will not go in detail of each of these techniques, but these are there in build software which is attached to any FTIR machine. But one must know that these are the different techniques possible for post processing of the FTIR data. Another important aspect of the FTIR is the scan. Scan means a complete cycle of movement of interferometer mirror actually. So, number of scans actually which are collected normally, it always affects the signal to noise ratio. That means, a complete cycle of movement of interferometer gives one scan. So, we can have many scans for a particular data to improve the signal to noise ratio. And signal to noise ratio is found to double as a square of number of scans. That is, if you have suppose one scan, the signal to noise ratio will be very low. It will double actually, if you go for force number of scans. And if you keep on increasing this from 4 to 16 to 64 to 256, the quality of data will be much better. Second important aspect in FTI is the scan speed or scan speed of optical parallel velocity. This is nothing but rate at which the interferometer mirrors moves. Okay. So, normally there are different kind of detectors. So, this is DG, uh, DTGS is one kind of detector where scan decreases the scan speed increases. And last one which is important for you is the scan range. Scan range is the spectral range or the wave number range of the analysis. It can normally span from 4000 to 400 centimeters inverse. So, that means the near uh, the mid infrared is basically 4000. So, to 400, but it can go to other infrared, far infrared or near infrared region also. Well, to give you uh, some other thing like important information about the single beam and the ratio sample spectrum. Scan mode can be either single beam or ratio. Single beam may be scan of background with no sample or maybe with a sample that is single beam. Just you put a sample or no sample and then collect this called single beam. Ratio mode actually implies or means that sample spectrum divided by the ratio or by ratio against the background. That means you have a background, you have a sample then you basically take the ratio of the sample to the background and then plot. As so, a single background of a single beam obviously background is very bad, you cannot fit it, you can clearly see here this is the background, but in ratio the background is very good. So, your signals can be easily seen. Well, uh, as I said uh, these are the basic things about the FTR you need to know. As I said the FTR actually used to do both quantitative and the qualitative data analysis. And, uh, First, we will discuss the qualitative analysis, what all qualitative things we can do. As I said, this is used mostly, uh, mostly for detecting different kinds of organic, uh, identify different kind of organic compound, but it can be also used for inorganic compounds, which I will show at the end of my lecture today. Identification of an organic compound is basically two step process in FTR. The first step involves determining the functional group present by examining the group frequency region. What is that? You know in an organic compound there are different functions possible like alcohol group, ketone group or aldehyde group or many others possible. So, therefore, that is the first step. First step is to determine this in functional group and that is done by examining the group frequency region. Second step is then it involves a detailed comparison of a spectrum of the unknown sample which you are examining the spectra of pure compounds that contain all the functional group found in the first step. So, first we find as functional groups and you know once we have suppose one or two or more functional groups in the sample present. So, if you want to really know what is the compound for then one needs to compare the spectrum of this unknown sample which you are experimenting with the spectra of all compounds available okay in the database contain all the functional group present. So, normally we have used something known as fingerprint region which is mentioned here. Fingerprint region is spans over 1200 600 centimeter inverse is particularly useful for because if there is a small difference in the structure of the compound or maybe the constitution of the molecule this change in the structure or the constitution of the molecule can lead to significant change in the appearance of and distribution of these peaks in this region. That is why it is called a fingerprint region. That means, 
it gives the fingerprint of the compound. Although we know that approximately the type of compound what it is from the first step, but in the second step when you compare we always look for the fingerprint regions to know whether any change in the structure or constitution that can lead to change in the peak positions. Well, like in, as I said the first step we do in the first step we do basically measure the functional group by looking at group frequencies. So, let me just explain what is group frequency is. In the group frequency means approximate frequencies or other wave numbers at which an organic functional group it can be ketone or C C double bond or C single bond or C C triple bond or O H absorb bond which absorb the infrared radiation can be calculated from the masses of the atoms and the force constants of the bonds. That means, knowing the masses of the atoms and the force constants of, constants of the atoms we can actually calculate the frequency approximately and that is what is known as group frequency. So, once you know the group presence we can actually calculate that. This frequency is called group frequencies because they are seldom total invariant because of the interaction with the other vibration associated with one or both of the atoms composing the group. Range of frequencies can then be assigned within which it is highly probable that absorption peak of a given functional group will appear that is the idea. So, if once we define the range of frequencies we assume or we can actually think that the peaks absorption peaks will appear for that compound in that frequency range. To give you some idea suppose if you can say alkanes in case of organic compounds you can see the frequency ranges follows in this 2850, 2970 which give a strong intensity peak or 1340 to 1470 it will also give a strong intensity peak. Then there are alkenes, alkynes you can look at this frequency regions in your screen and then you can go on doing amines okay, which comes about 3300 to 3500 mediums and then you have features like this aromatic alkenes, aromatic rings or amines where in these regions you have variable intensity possible. And then one can also go to alcohol, ethers, carboxylic groups where the strong uh, intensity peaks up uh, happens in the frequency range mentioned here. So, one can actually build this table this is obtained from Thomson higher education book and table number 17.3 you can go back and refer this book also. Well, to give you some more detail about fingerprint regions, small difference in the structure and constraints as I said can lead to change in the distribution of the absorption peaks and they have available in this. So, that means as a consequence of the fingerprint uh, of uh, the fingerprint region analysis the close match between the two spectra in the finger region can be possible and this will lead to the exact identification of the compound. Exact interpretation of data or this uh, in the spectra in the region is seldom possible because of the complexity of the spectra. Sometimes the spectra is very complex because of the change of this you know small change in composition or the structure it may not be possible even to actually pinpoint the exact structure of the compound presence. To give you some more idea so this is uh, taken from uh, this kind of compound you can clearly see there are 1, 2, 3, 4 methyl groups and uh, CH bond and CC bonds. So, if I take an FTR spectra of from this we get CC stretch bond at if you know this wave number of 3.5 approximately micron in uh, wavelengths that this is actually plotted in terms of wavelength lambda. And then you have CH band bands, painting can also lead to bands and then you have many other frequency chains. So, that means by looking at these bands we can actually carefully say that what is it is. Now, uh, if you change it uh, that is what I am actually going to tell you how it is to be done. So, if you if you look at this CH3, CH3, CH, CH, CH2 this compound where you have regions which are marked as a group frequency regions, regions which are marked as a fingerprint regions. In the group frequency regions you have C H stage band, C H band they are same this compound also this compound also there is no difference ok. Now, and uh, big although we have C H 2 here is C H here. So, there is a small change in the composition can lead and only lead to change in the fingerprint region you see here the peaks in this place and peaks in this place 
they are different. So, that means this is the fingerprint region where the changes in this composition or the structure little bit of the compound can give rise to changes in the peak positions of the peak number of peaks intensity of the peaks. That is why this is known as fingerprint region, this is known as group frequency regions where we can uh, guess the type of compound presence, but any change in structure can be revealed on the fingerprint regions. I hope this is clear to give you more idea or even give more examples because examples are always you know better than this. So, if you look at this compound here there is an OH group okay, and in this compound here there is chloride group and then you have CC bonds and CH, CH3, CH3, CH3 here also CH3, CH3, 3 CH methyl groups are there. So, if you look at it again from these two uh, if you look at group frequency regions obviously there is an all group here which can be clearly see for the OH stage band here presents and CH stage band also can be seen here present. On the other hand this has only CH they are chlorine CCL. So, CCL does not come in a group frequency region. So, CH stage band is present here. So, by comparing and then you have CH band bent and CH bent here also there are little difference, but more or less same. So, by looking at this group frequency region we can clearly see there is a wedge group here present there is no wedge group present in the second compound that is this. Now, if you look at the fingerprint regions that is very distinct. The fingerprint region here and here are distinctly different. This case CCL stretch band is present here because there is no CCL bond here. So, there is no CCL band presence here. So, the by looking at these two regions group frequency and the fingerprint regions one can classify even a finite scale finite scale change in the, in the compound structure very easily. First from the group frequency region we can know the groups present and the finger region we can know the exact structure present. So, this is what I like to impress upon that is how the analysis are done in the FTIR. Well, now nowadays nobody uses you know or you cannot live without computers. So, therefore, the all the qualitative analysis done always with the computer search system. Virtually all inferring instruments manufacturers nowadays offer you a computer search system that actually assist you in identifying the compounds from a large number of stored spectral data. And the this data actually shows or show you the position and the relative magnitude of the peaks present in the spectrum of the different analyte which can be then probed later on. So, people actually uh, take this collect the data and store in a computer and then what you do is that once you have a FTR spectrum spectra from an unknown or compounds you just match the profiles and then when you find a similarity you just use it. So, that is nothing but like x-ray diffraction data matching you have a JCPD database in x-ray diffraction you compare your x-ray diffraction pattern from an unknown sample JCPD database if it matches you are done if it does not match then you keep on doing this analysis final scale same thing is valid for this kind of analysis here also. To give an example, suppose you have got a spectrum from an unknown sample like this and you want to analyze what for this compound is. So, you just load this file into the computer, it will search whenever you find a real match like this you can clearly see the real match very perfect match like this. You come to know this is US 0000022 benzene. This is a number of the file just like a JCPD is data card you have a number and this is benzene. So, therefore, although this is very simple benzene everybody will probably know it and therefore, by comparing this database with the computer one can easily carefully say that. Well, now as I said in the last lecture also that uh, infrared spectroscopy in fact, in FTIR can be also used to do the quantitative ap, uh, analysis also. What is what are the quantitative analysis one can do? Well, quantitative analysis in this case differs extensively from the UV visible uh, molecular spectroscopy methods because of the complexity of the spectra and also some cases you have seen even some of the spectra the bands of the spectra are very very narrow. 
and then you have instrumental instrument quantity data obtained from the instruments are generally significantly inferior quality than the UV and you know visible spectrometer. So therefore, normally we do not do much of the quantification using this. The quantum in the sense of using the peak strength, the area under the peak or the peak height, and uh, can be done. So to give you some more idea, how uh, the qualitatively things can be possible. Xylene we know, xylene is basically benzene ring based compound, you have ortho, meta and pyro that is OMP xylenes and if you take FTI spectra very clearly you can see this is transmission pulses wavelength, you can see ortho xylene gives a peak at about 13.5 micrometer wavelengths, but M xylene gives two peaks one at close to 13, one at 14.3 micrometer. On the other hand, P xylene gives you peaks at 12.5. So, by looking at this fine scale structure, you can clearly say what kind of xylene is present. Let us look at ethyl benzene, again another complex compound, you can see the peak positions. Cyclo exchange solvents actually normally do not give any peak, that is why these are can be used for FTIR uh, study. Well, nowadays as I said, you know, uh, if you look at literature, the uh, literature sense of if you search in computer about infrared spectroscopy, infrared spectroscopy becomes very important in 1970s when it was rather discovered or instrumentation was made for determination of the air contaminants. Air can have different pollutants like carbon monoxide, methyl, ethyl ketone or even many other contaminants can be present nitrous, nitrous oxides or carbon monoxide, they can be measured even precisely using quantitative techniques. To give you an idea, some of the values again I taken from Thomson higher education. So, if you look at the suppose actual concentration of carbon monoxide in a particular system is 15, so the results uh, actually, actually 49.1 result will show you 50, error is even less than 2 percent. Similarly, for methyl ketone, methanol, ethyl oxide chloroform. So, this is what the kind of quantification one can do using the peaks area on the peaks for the infrared spectroscopy or you know FTI spectroscopy. Now, I will just uh, talk to you about the how the machine looks like and how things can be done and to wrap up the FTIR methods, FTIR principles. Well, FTIR actually you know as I said, it is basically used to measure low concentrations in the solutions and uh, in fact, it can be used to measure air. So, first significant presence of you know water vapor, methane, everything can be done. So, that means machine nowadays are built are very complex, but I am going to talk about very simple machine which is uh, the simple basically you are going to talk about the principles and show you some of these basic steps. So, basic components of FTR is first of all a source as you can see that is a source here that is a, a IR source and it emits a broad band of different kind of wavelengths or infrared radiations. Normally uh, the IR source used is basically uh, known as t met gas met FTR CR series in the machine which is uh, people use normally in the labs are a silicon carbide compound and it has uh, normally heated if you heat up to 1500 50 degree Kelvin then it emits IR radiations. So, IR radiation then goes through an interferometer the real heart of the machine is basically interferometer. So, air radiation coming from the source passes through an interferometer which we will discuss in detail and uh, then interferometer modulates this infrared radiations and then interferometer basically performs an optical inverse Fourier transformation on the IR radiation and this modulated IR beam then passes through the sample like here modulated beams here it passes through the sample and then from the sample the whatever comes out is detected in a detector which is liquid and cooled mercury cadmium telluride detector normally and uh, many cases so, digital signal is obviously digitized and it can be transformed Fourier transformed by a computer good to get a good uh, 
uh, good you know spectrum. So, what is done is that you have infrared source if you write infrared source and then from there it goes to interferometer and interferometer modulates and then it falls on a sample and that sample it goes to a detector and detector to computer. This is the schematically we can write down this is what actually a machine consists of. So, uh, this is what is shown here. So, you can see this is the interferometer and then sample and then we get the data. Now, as I said first IR light source and uh, this is the plot of spectral radiant versus wavelengths as a function of temperatures. As you see from 200, 300 up to 1000 or 6000 the spectral radiance increases. Normally, we used to heat normally heat the material from uh, the uh, 1000 to 2000 degree Celsius uh, like that. So, like SIC is heated up to 1500 uh, 50 degree Kelvin to get higher radiations. So, you get sufficient am amount of spectral radiance. Radiance is nothing but a energy per unit area. Now, to give an idea what the interferometer looks like, let me just tell, tell you what exactly. This is the heart of the machine. FTR machine. So, as you see this is a light source, you can also have a helium neon things, light source means infrared source, this is ceramic like silicon carbide. Now, this is nothing but actually Michelson type of plane mirror interferometer. Okay. And so, therefore, infrared radiation is collected by and collimated, you know this is what is done as here, you are collected and collimated by this mirror and then it falls onto a beam splitter. You see here this is beam splitter. The real task of the beam splitter is that it transmits one half of the radiation that is transmit one half of the radiation and uh, then ref, uh, reflects the other half. So, it one half is gone here, other half is gone there. So, one half is falling on a fixed mirror, other half is falling on a movable mirror. Now, what actually happens if these two waves are then you know interfere that is what is done the work of the interferometer. So, one of the infrared radiation then finally, goes to the uh, this sample you can see that this is again goes to the sample and uh, reflected okay, again go to the sample and then first if before going to the sample then gets reflected back to the uh, beam splitter to the moving mirror that is the moving mirror like this and then come back. So, reflected back and uh, other half of the radiation basically going to the sample first uh, gone through this beam splitter okay, and then reflected from the fixed mirror. So, one half is going to this one other half is going to this I have marked it like this. Okay. So, interference happens because of these two different they are all same same wavelengths because beam splitter only reduces the energy uh, the what is called absorbs certain amount allows certain amount to pass through and certain amounts to be reflected. So, wavelength is same and then gets uh, interfere and you create interference pattern and then finally, this interfere in pattern from beam falls on a sample and then it is collimated on a detector whatever is coming from the sample. So, that is the basically the heart of the machine. So, this is what is shown here in the arrows it goes back. Okay. So, now uh, if I have to talk about interference in detail, detail you know if I have suppose fixed mirror and mobile mirror you have seen. So, if both these waves are very similar in terms of the uh, spatial and the temporal part. So, they can interfere and produce same space interference this kind of. If you have opposite then there will be nothing there will be destructive interference and if you have again similar looking but displaced by lambda wavelength. So, you have interference pattern like this. Okay. So, what are the situations in a real situations the interference pattern will look like this because of continuous phase shift and you get very strong 
you know increase in the amplitude of the wave form when it comes out from the interferometer. So, that is basically idea to create a strong interfer interfer interference of the waves coming from the source before it falls on a sample. And then one can actually do the similar analysis for monochromatic dichroic and the continuous spectrum. If you do monochromatic, uh, oh sorry, this is once you get the signal from the uh, so, uh, from the sa uh, sample after detector absorbs, then this can be converted into Fourier transforms. So, this is uh, like A z versus wave number uh, the monochromic light and then this is the interference wave. This is a dichroic light you have two uh, you can see then it this is this kind of signal you can get from interference wave. You have a continuous large number of waves and you get a this. This is what you normally get in the FTR spectrometer or in the FTR plots. Okay. So, that is about the machine and how things are done. Now, in the last stage what I am going to discuss is basically is how the samples to be handled. Because many cases you need to know how the samples to be handled otherwise you may not get good data. Normally, is the we need solutions in for doing this such analysis. So, convenient way of obtaining infrared spectra is on a solution prepared to contain a known amount of concentration of a sample. And uh, this is basically to get uh, you know data from a known sample and known concentration. This technique is somewhat limited in its application. However, if you know large number of solvent presence and they are transparent to the infrared regions, then this can be done. Then second thing which is we use normally in FTI is solvent, how to handle the solvents. Normally no solvent because you have to have solvent to dissolve this uh, unknown compound which you are going to analyze. No single solvent is found to be transparent through the entire infrared regions that is a big problem. What are alcohols of syndrome employed? You cannot employ them because they absorb infrared and they absorb infrared they will create problem. Not only that they can also attack many of the alkali metal halides and many other materials which is used for the windows of the infrared spectroscope. So, what are things we can use? Well, this is carbon different compounds between carbon disulfide, carbon tetrachloride, tetrachloroethylene chloroform, dimethyl formine, dioxin, cyclohexane and benzene. If you look at it, the absorbent as a function of wavelengths or wave numbers, this is absorbed here, absorbed there, but not absorbed here. So, you can use it if you want to analyze in this frequency range. Carbon tetrachloride does not absorb at low wave numbers. Same thing is valid for tetrachloroethane, chloroform again same thing. Dichloroformide is can be used in this frequency range. Dioxin can be used here between 1600 to 1700, 1600 to 1250 or maybe up to thousands. Benzene can be used at a high a low wave numbers or high wavelengths. So, therefore, by tailoring this uh, you know different uh, compounds one can actually study uh, the uh, the what is called different compounds uh, different wave number range using different solvents. Then you have cells sodium chlorides actually windows are most commonly used in the machine because they do not absorb IR radiation, but you know they surfaces can can get fog because sodium hydrochloride can be you know absorb moisture and then can fog and then can reduce the uh, or rather lead to absorption of the infrared radiation and then signal strength will reduce. Sometime polishing with buffering powder can help, but sometime may not. Liquids which can be there. So, when the amount of liquid sample is small a suitable solvent is unavailable many times you can use a you know pure liquid or of that compound without solvent. A drop of the neat liquid is squeezed between a two rock salt plates or sodium chloride plates to give a layer that is thickness of very small thickness of the point 0 0.01 millimeter or less. These two plates are then held together and mounted in the beam path. Such a techniques does not give reproducible transmission data, but one can do qualitative analysis with this that is possible. So, whenever you do not find any suitable solvent you can actually do this such a kind of analysis. 
to give you this, this is the back plate, sodium chloride front plate and the windows okay. and these are the neoprene gaskets and these are the actually uh, can be fitted into this. So, you can see and sometime you can use pieces. So, this infrared radiation path goes through and comes back like this front plate to the back plate and then and these are the uh, nuts, this are has to be all made up of special quality material. So, it does not absorb the infrared radiations and what kind of things material windows can be used? Sodium chloride, it can be used for large range that is the best material available, but it can be soluble in water that is the problem. Otherwise, you can use potassium chloride, potassium bromide, but solubility is very bad. Cesium iodide can be used. The important thing to use is fused silica, which is insoluble in water or alcohol, and it can be used in large frequency, the wave number range. Or you can use even zinc sulfide, which is insoluble, but you can also use that. The uh, polymers cannot be used. They are very you know uh, do not absorb air radiation is very small wave range wave number range. Well, I have already told about that how to use liquids, let us talk how to use solids. Most organic compounds exhibit numerous absorption peaks through the solids in the mid infrared regions. So, finding out a solvent is does not there is an overlap of these peaks is impossible. So, as a consequence spectra are obtained on dispersion of the solids in a liquid or solid matrix. Some cases you can use pellets, most commonly techniques for the handling solid sample is to use KBR pelleting, okay, you must know that. A very small amount of the finely ground sample is intimately mixed with 100 milligram of the diet potassium bromide and mixer is pressed in a dye uh, about 10,000 to 15,000 pounds per square inch to yield a transparent disc and then this can be used. In fact, we do in our lab the cases. You can use moles also. Uh, they are soluble in not soluble in infrared transparent solvent and conveniently not can be pelleted in KBR open obtained by dispersing the analyte in a mineral oil or fluorinated hydrocarbon moules. So, moules are actually formed by grinding 2 to 5 milligrams of finely dispersed powder in a presence of 1 or 2 drops of heavy hydrocarbon oil. They can be nuzol. If hydrocarbon bands interfere, flow loop hydrogenated polymer can be used and then examines. So, there are many such techniques. Gases can also be done, low uh, spectrum low boiling liquids can be obtained by permitting sample to expand in evacuated cylindrical cells possible. Solution solvent I have already discussed. Well, now in the last I will show you some solid sample data uh, because what uh, people normally face, these are actually hydroxypatite titanium composites. You know the problem with solid sample is to you have to use mix with KBR pellets and do that. You can clearly see the different stretching bands like waste stretching bands, absorb water, moisture, CO3 ions and then for hydroxypatites these are the bands present there. Titanium can be present in titanium dioxide, titanium TiO or calcium can be present in calcium oxide. One can actually do such analysis for different kinds of uh, pellets with titanium concentration 5 Ti or 10 Ti and 20 Ti and get all kinds of uh, data like bonds presence in the solid samples very easily. Lastly, uh, to give you a data about the graphene oxide and reduced graphene oxide, this can be also studied by FTR. See, you can graphene oxide you have this, this is basically uh, I think wage stage speak, and then these are actually coming from C double O or C C, and last one comes band comes C O epoxy. If you have looked at this is reduced graphene oxide. Graphene oxide obviously there will be larger wave stretch and then CO epoxy, CO carboxy bonds are present other than all those bonds present in the graphene oxide. And then if you even do with silver, you obviously will not get any peaks from the silver, but you will uh, get very large stretch of the wave stretch band much compared to that. So, one can actually, one can actually do this kind of analysis and solid samples very easily and uh, finished off. Okay, so with this I complete my things in the uh, FTR.